I wrote down four things for this next speaker's intro, so I'm just gonna read them verbatim. I'm sorry in advance, no I'm kidding. Uh, YouTube channel is smart, get smarter every day. Motto is to explore the world using science and keep learning every day. Wants to be an astronaut, announce the waivers. I announce the waivers, okay. Everyone, welcome to the stage, Destin Sandlin. Announce the waivers? That's important. So you're saying I need to announce the waivers. What? Never mind. We'll see. How's it going? My name is Destin Sandlin. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Oh, I was told to take my hat off. I'm sorry. Is that better? Um, I'm probably different than most speakers at Skepticon. I'm a little laid back. Um, I don't prepare very well. I just kind of talk off the top of my head. So I apologize ahead of time if this sounds like a rambling mess, but it's just, just me. So I apologize. So let's get right to it. Um, this is how this is going to go down. I'm going to tell you who I am, about my pursuit of truth, why I'm here. You guys are taking a lot of good pictures, I think. This is kind of, it's kind of funny. Uh, arguing on the internet. Has anybody ever argued on the internet? <laughs> yeah? All right, we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. I think we'll enjoy it. Why skepticism is good, which is really convenient seeing that I'm talking at a place called Skepticon, right? All right. And then a threshold of belief, and finally, we're going to do some applications, or as I like to call it, activities. It's kind of like karate in the garage, only a little bit different. All right, so let me talk about who I am. Here we go. I am your typical Alabama redneck kid from the Bible Belt. The normal type of, of speaker that you have at Skepticon, right? <laughs> right? All right, so what I want to talk to you about is a little bit about where I came from and, and what I'm like, okay? Seriously, I grew up in Alabama. This is me with my, my dog, Thunder. I think my parents were practicing natural selection. They wanted to see if he would kill me off at a young age or something like that. But um, I'm one of four. I'm the oldest kid of four. And um, I was influenced heavily by my grandfather. My grandfather's name is Pryor Wilson Sandlin. He worked at NASA. Have you guys ever heard of NASA? We went to the moon, by the way. We did go to the moon. So NASA is uh, actually somewhere uh, in North Alabama. There used to be an organization called the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. My grandfather worked for NASA before it was NASA. So we used to spend a lot of time going outside, looking at the stars, talking about all kinds of stuff. And it gave me a perspective, a unique perspective, for a little kid in Alabama. I realized that I was a really, really, really small person in a really, really, really big universe. Does anybody else ever feel like that? Do you? We've got a lot of common, don't we? Yeah, okay, so let's look at it. My educational background. So we're gonna go from this little redneck kid playing in the dirt with a big dog that could kill me at any point in time. We're gonna go up, hang out with granddaddy, look at the NASA stuff, and then we're at my education. I decided to go to school at the University of Alabama, mechanical engineering department. This is the physics, uh, physics building where I met my wife, Tara, and I got a degree in mechanical engineering. Has anybody ever read The Martian? Yeah? Okay, Mark Watney was, he was a, a mechanical engineer, which is really, really awesome. So when I was in mechanical engineering, he was a mechanical engineer and a botanist. I was a mechanical engineering intern at a place that did jet fuel, hydraulic pumps and jet fuel pumps and things like that for fighter jets. And instead of being a botanist, I went and did internships at Little Debbie Snack Cakes, making snack cakes, which is quite amazing. You think, no, seriously, let's stop about, you know, let's talk about this. So you know the stripes on top of a zebra cake? I'm gonna talk about that for just a second. You just look at that and you're like, okay, wavy lines, no big deal. Oh no, it's fascinating. I used to sit there and stare at the line that made zebra cakes because it was so amazing. They had this little arm and a motor that would turn and these nozzles would spray chocolate out and as the, as the conveyor belt with this, the zebra cakes came along, it would just make this sinusoidal motion and all I could see was math. It's fantastic. Really, really amazing and it really spoiled eating uh, little Debbie snack cakes for me because all I see is like math and engineering every time I eat them now. I love them. It's great. Anyway, so like most people probably in the room, um, university was my formative years. I went from this prepubescent acne laden thing on the left to, I don't know, I'm not going to say man, but this weird thing on the right. <laughs> Something happened in there. That arrow means a lot. I don't really know what goes on, but it involved less acne. That's all I know. So. These were the formative years of my life. I learned a lot about myself, what it meant to work hard, what it meant to gain knowledge and understanding about topics. It was a blast. I really enjoyed it. Um, fast forward, and then this is what really has changed my life. I've got four kids. They're beautiful kids. Um, you can see I've got my hands full, literally. I haven't figured out whose foot this is, but 
This is, uh, this is my world right now. I love my kids, I really do. Um, I'm a dad first, engineer second. No, no, husband first, dad second. Did I get that right, ladies? Okay, husband first, dad second, engineer, and then something else, whatever. I don't really know what else counts. So, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about my pursuit of truth. Just an engineer, I'm a nobody from Alabama, right? But I really believe in trying to discover truth. So much so that when I got my degree in engineering, I came out with all this knowledge and information and stuff crammed in my head. I'm like, what the heck do I do with that? I decided to work for an organization whose motto simply was, get this, this is pretty cool, truth. That's the motto of the organization. Um, it's a division of the Army Test Evaluation Command. I'm a tester. I'm paid full time to test things and figure out what the truth is. It's really awesome. I get to use my engineering skills to do that, and I get a kick out of it. And one of the reasons I get a kick out of it is because I do it for the United States of America. And I stink and love the United States of America. I don't care what anybody says. We are hanging out in a room right now talking about ideas that are controversial in many different nations all over the world, and we're loving it, right? There's a, I don't know, there's a dinosaur outside. There's gonna be a prom later. There's a lot of things going on. There's a stegosaurus on a skateboard right here. It's cool, right? But, but think about this. You see this, uh, this American flag right here made in origami? This was made, I was, I was working several weeks ago at this place in Texas. This was made by a lady. Who, she fled communist China back during the uh, Vietnam War. She was able to get on a helicopter and make it to America. And she wanted to show her appreciation for her adoptive nation. And the fact that she gets to do really cool stuff like think what she wants to think. And so she decided to make this to show her appreciation for America. It's a really big deal. I'm a really big fan of America. So I'm doing just that. I'm using my time, talents, energy, you know, my, my whatever you want to call it, my skills to try to advance that. I want to advance the cause of freedom, religious liberty. I'm totally awesome. I'm very excited about the separation of church and state. All this stuff is really, really good. And uh, I just can't get enough. So here you can see this is me prepping for a rocket test. Um, I didn't, okay, so my master's, excuse me, my bachelor's was in mechanical engineering, the master's is in aerospace engineering, and so I've been doing rocket testing and stuff like that. So this is an example of me using my talents and energies to try to advance the cause of freedom. I'm doing specifically a rocket test here. Here, you can see these are other things that I do. I'm gonna grab some water real quick. On the left, you can see that I am testing a vehicle. The, the thing I'm doing is I'm installing toxicity sensors inside the back of an armored vehicle. When this vehicle is attacked, these sensors detect the likelihood that the guys on the inside are going to die. It's heavy stuff, really, really heavy stuff. On the right, I'm, uh, this is a familiarization flight. I'm, I'm checking out what's called P-Factor in a fixed-wing aircraft. These are all different kinds of stuff I get to do at my job. It's really, really, really cool. So what do you do when you're trying to look at the world and try to unravel the mysteries and figure out something about the natural world around you? Does anybody know what you use? Huh? What? <coughs> That's right. Who came up with the scientific method? Does anybody remember? <coughs> say it again. I heard it. Did you say it? Francis Bacon. That's right. In the 1600s, this dude named Francis Bacon came up with this little thing called the scientific method. Really stinking big deal. You hear people say things like, I love science. You know? What they really mean is, I really love the application of the scientific method to unravel the truths of the world, right? Saying, I love science is like saying, I love hammer. <laughs> yeah? Like, I love this specific tool, right? So, the scientific method is what I use to unravel different truths about the world. That's what I like to do. Okay, so, going forward here. So, my pursuit of truth led me to do some other stuff offline at night. Engineer during the day. It's not as cool as like Batman or anything like that, but during the day, I do all this engineering stuff, and during the night, I have this YouTube channel. Has anybody ever heard of YouTube? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Never heard of it? All right, so there's this thing called YouTube, and it's like the library at Alexandria, only videos. That's pretty much what it is. So what I started doing is my job did not satisfy my natural curiosity, so I started doing stuff at night. I started asking really stinking weird questions about normal-looking things and just videoing myself when I did it. So it's, it's got to be really big. It's one of the larger science channels 
in the United States, which is totally weird for a little guy running around in the dirt in Alabama to, to do something like that eventually. Does that make sense? I, it's weird to me. So I don't deserve it, and uh, I don't know. I think people just like it, like, you know, to see what the weird guy's up to next or something like that. Let me give you an example of the stuff I do on my YouTube channel. This is a video I put up because I was interested in something I observed in chickens, okay? Go with me on this. I put this video up and I was on a totally different level when I did this because I was in grad school taking a dynamic controls, a rocket control class, and I was thinking about the feedback loop required to guide a rocket to its target. That's where my head is when I made this chicken video. So watch this. Hey, it's me, Destin. Uh, I got my dad a present for Father's Day, and it's kind of weird. So I figured I'd show you an interesting principle with the present. It's a chicken. I got my dad a chicken for Father's Day. And I want to show you a pretty interesting method that chickens have to keep their head stable. Uh, you know, in guidance and control, you have feedback loops. And so you have to know your position and where your relative motion is going so you can compensate for it. But chickens are really good at this. So I'll show you. Watch his head stay totally stationary <laughs> as I move his body. I can move his body in pretty much any direction. His head stays rock solid in that position. <laughs> this is really hard to do. So anyway, he knows exactly where his body is and where his body's moving. <laughs> it's kind of fun to Are watch. Are you guys watching, watching the translator? So they're really good at it. I don't really know why, but I'm sure there's an explanation. Yeah, there's my, my sister Browley with the other chicken. We got dad, so. Anyway. I'm trying to think about why you guys are laughing. I'm pretty sure that the reason you're laughing is that you were That's absolutely kind of blown away me by, so I'll stop by the uh, control system at work. All right, right? so, yeah. bye. Yeah? The perfect father's idea. <laughs> yep, he liked it. Yeah, the, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, as you can see, the Alabama is strong with this one. By the way, <laughs> can we say thank you to, to, to the uh, ASL translator? You did really good. I'm going to keep giving you hard ones. Yeah, let's, let's see how you do tonight. All right, so, um, so when I uploaded that video, I was thinking in a very deep level, okay? Where are you laughing? I was literally thinking about control system theory for rockets and guidance and control, positional versus velocity feedback. I was thinking there, and everybody, when I uploaded the internet, they're like, look at this redneck playing with a chicken on the internet. What's wrong with this dude? So that was one of my first successes. So um, I had no plans of making a video that people enjoyed for those sorts of reasons. I was genuinely interested about the world and how it worked. Uh, here's another video. This one's a little less funny, but uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by this. This is called honey boiling. If you've ever put honey in you know, your coffee or on toast or anything like that, if you notice, a lot of people don't. They just do it and just don't even think about it. Because of the viscosity of the honey, as it comes down, you see Q is mass flow, and A is the diameter of the stream, and you got the tail length, and you got the oscillatory frequency, and things like that. This is a system that we can almost describe with math. We can't quite. What we know at this point, what scientists know, is that this is a 17th order polynomial with 19 boundary conditions. It's really, really fascinating. <laughs> this is the sort of stuff that I really, really enjoy. So when most people like that know me in real life, they're like, hey man, you want some toast? Or like, you want some syrup on that waffle? I'm like, yeah, bring it over, buddy. But, and, I, and I just lock in. <laughs> this is fascinating. So I just look at the world differently. That's what I'm trying to explain. I, I, I'm not normal. And it's, it's just different. A lot of people think that at the surface level, there's this goofy redneck with a weird accent that doesn't know what he's talking about. But in my head, it feels like I'm doing important stuff. Might not be true, but that's what it feels like. Um, another thing I want to show you is, eventually I started dialing this in. And I started understanding how I could try to communicate these complex topics that were going on in front of me with other people. So I could try to get information. The goal was to try to get information out of my brain into other people's brains in a way that's intelligent and respectful 
and that people like. And one of the challenges I decided to accept was to drop a cat on the internet and not have mad people firebomb my house. That was the goal. So here's the video that um, I created about the paradox on how a cat lands on its feet. And it sounds like, oh, it's just, oh, cats always land on their feet, ha, ha, ha. Oh, no. Oh, no. If you sit down with a piece of paper and you're a physicist and you try to explain how a cat lands on its feet, you're talking 17 pages minimum with math. It's very, very, very complicated. So things are not always as simple as they seem. It's not just the cat whipping its tail around or something like that. So this is the introduction to that video, just so you can kind of see what Smarter Every Day, the YouTube channel, is all about. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. So you've probably observed that cats almost always land on their feet. Today's question is why? Like most simple questions, there's a very complex answer. For instance, let me reword this question. How does a cat go from feet up to feet down in a falling reference frame without violating the conservation of angular momentum? Now, I've studied free falling bodies, my own in fact, in several different environments, and once I get my angular rotation started in one direction, I can't stop it. Today, we're gonna use a high-speed camera. We're not gonna use Allie, because this is my daughter's cat. I don't wanna hurt it. We're gonna use a stunt cat. Let me introduce you to Gigi, the stunt cat. I'll just flip the, uh, the video vertical and then motion track the cat. It's just gonna take a lot more effort in post. We're gonna try to do it in a way that doesn't make anybody mad. That's pretty hard to do. You gotta drop the cat. Ready, Gigi? Check out the high speed data there, Gigi. No, 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 no. I heard some people in the background going, oh, look at the kitty cat. No, this is science going on over here. None of this. The cat was so scared. No, that's a stunt cat. This is not a normal cat. Alabama cats are different than Missouri cats. You just got to accept that and move on, all right? So this gives you an idea of what kind of person I am and the things that I do. I look at stuff different than most people. But when they first look at me, they, again, they're like, this guy's kind of weird, you know? All right, so here's the part where you either decide if you like me or you hate me, and I, I'm, I'm sorry straight up. So you got 3.3 whatever it is million people that watch your YouTube channel. And, you know, I got this weird stuff going on in my head, and I'm looking at the world differently. And this is the thing that people get really, really upset about. I love the scientific method, and I love exploring the world. But at the end of my videos right here, often I'll put... A, a Bible verse, okay? And this Bible verse, I am a Christian, by the way. I am a Christian. And uh, I'm not upset about it, all right? <laughs> if that makes any sense. So you're not either? That's great. So we have a lot in common, you and I. So, so the Bible verse I pick is always a Bible verse that I, I try not to tick anybody off, okay? Um, this is just a simple acknowledgement to some of the things that help me view the world differently. So this is Psalm 111, 2, which is great at the works of the Lord pondered by all who delight in them, okay? I don't think it's that offensive, especially if I don't put any words on there, and you can either choose to look it up or not. But the way it works, it, by the way, the reason, I detect, or the reason I chose this verse is because it's on the doors of the Cavendish Lab at Cambridge University where the electron was discovered. So anyway, it's really, really cool. Scientific inquiry, some people look at the world a little bit different. So I've done the math, right? 3.3 million people, okay? If you take 1% of 3.3 million people, you've got 33,000 people, right? And if you take 1% of that 33,000 people that usually comment on the video, it's about 1%, you end up with about 300 people who are usually angry at me. And uh, I just wanna say, it's really good to finally get to meet all of you in person. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been wanting to, I've been wanting to meet you face to face and not hide behind my keyboard and just have this conversation and talk with you rather than yell at each other on keyboards, right? That's why I'm here, okay? So the reason I'm here at Skepticon, straight up, I'm, not, I'm, I'm laying all my cards on the table here, is because it's weird, right? I got an email from Lauren Lane, the, the beautiful lady in the red dress, that set all this up, okay? And Lauren sent me an email and said, hey, do you want to come to Skepticon? It's the largest convention for atheists and free thinkers in, in the nation. Do you want to come to Skepticon and talk? And I looked at it, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. 
the, uh, the enemy thing came up, right? Just like you have. We all have it. Let's just, let's just let's quit lying. It's like, danger, danger, the bad guys, right? <laughs> the bad guys. And I looked at the email, and I'm like, oh, man. So they want me to go talk at an atheist convention? I'm a Christian. Do they know that? And so I replied to Lauren, and I said, Lauren, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. Do you know that? You're supposed to hate me and, like, want to eat my babies and stuff. And, like, <laughs> like the, the flying spaghetti monster something I read about on Reddit. I don't even know, but you're not supposed to like me, right? And so uh, she said, no, here's the deal. So Skepticon is a cool place. And I, I must admit, I was kind of scared coming here. But she said, look, we're not going to give you an honorarium. We're not going to pay you to come here or anything like that. We just want to hang out with you. And we want to have a conversation. We want to talk. But here's the deal. I was promised a mountain of high fives, your eternal gratitude, and a rocking great time. So that's why I'm here. So the question is, yeah, thank you. So the question is, am I going to get a mountain of high fives after this? Because that's kind of what I'm after. OK, OK, very good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So which is good. This is, I'm like, like, you say that like I was just joking. But no, really, high fives are kind of an important thing to me. I actually have a part of my website, smartereveryday.com slash high five, where when I go all over the world, I pay, take these pictures of high fives. And when people do something cool on the internet, I just email them the link, and I'm like, high five for you. Pick the one you want. <laughs> so, so seriously, I want to give you guys high fives. Thank you for being hospitable. Uh, thank you for not being mad at me for no reason. Thank you for just talking to me and treating me like a person. I really appreciate that, OK? So all right, let's, let's move on. So uh, let's talk about arguing on the internet, OK? Wait a second, we, we just became friends. Are we allowed to talk about this? Because we, we had kind of a moment there, and I'm going backwards. I really did not think through the order of these slides now that I think about it. Now let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about arguing on the internet. Um, it doesn't matter what the topic of the video is. It doesn't matter. I was talking to one of the, the largest channels on YouTube, uh, a friend of mine who lives in London, and I said, have you... Have you seen that any, any video at all can kind of divulge into a religious argument, no matter what it is? And he said, the other day I literally posted a video about a spoon, and the guys are like, what is the spoon? Your God does not exist. <laughs> or what is the spoon, and God is in charge of all, or whatever it is. Just both sides are just angry for no reason. It's not one side, it's not the other. It's just the fringe, the outliers, the people on the edge that are making all the noise, right? Most of us are sane, rational people. So let's talk about that. Are science and faith mutually exclusive? I don't know. Does this Destin guy, does he have cognitive dissonance? Is he, is he a simpleton that lived in Alabama? He probably is a nice guy, probably made good grades in school, probably is pretty clever. You know, he does that rocket business. But when it comes to the Jesus stuff, he probably just shuts off that part of his brain and then doesn't even think. Don't get upset. Don't get scared. I'm not going to try to convince you to believe what I believe. Just I'm going to tell you that up front. But is this what's happening in my brain? Am I going to have the smart side over here, and then I'm just going to draw a line and be like, I'm going to do my stupid stuff over here. I'm, this is where I'm going to hang out with Jesus, and this is where I'm going to literally calculate the escape velocity to get to Mars. I'm going to do it like that. Is that, is that what's going on in my head? So... Part of the reason that Skepticon exists, I read the Wikipedia page from the founder, is to equip those who believe like this to, um, to believe what many of you in the room believe, is to equip you to better approach weirdos like me and do whatever it is you're wanting to do to me. I don't know what it is. So that's part of the thing. So let's just use me as like this test case. You can kind of like poke me around like a lab rat and try to figure me out. So when it comes to arguing on the internet, right, I, I like to look at things like this. A lot of times, if something happens, somebody will mention like the Big Bang on the internet. And it's so interesting to me how quickly people forget and how quickly people jump to arguments that they don't really understand. I'll give you an example. So I was on the internet the other day, and some, some person talks about the Big Bang. Some Christian gets on there and starts railing against him about how stupid he is. You know, the Big Bang doesn't, there's no possible way. Do you really think I came from a blah, 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 blah? Which is very interesting to people who read and think a lot because the Big Bang was invented by a Christian. I don't know if you knew that. There wasn't a lot of laughter. I was kind of hoping for it. 
But literally, the Big Bang was first proposed by a guy named Georges Lemaitre. But as a joke. Okay, so Georges Lemaitre, he came up with this thing um, called the, it had something to do with expanding universe. He was an astrophysicist, right? It was the first, the first submission of Hubble's principles of the expanding universe. A Christian guy came up with that, okay? So when people rail against you about the Big Bang not being possible and you should bow to God and all that good stuff, just say, well, if you have a problem with the Big Bang, Christian, then why did you guys invent it in the first place? Does that make sense? So just feel free to get right back at people like that. I mean, just people often are not read well on the topic. They're just making noise. Do, do we agree with that with arguments on the Internet? Often, it's, yeah, I heard it over here. Somebody said it. It's both sides of the argument. It's not one. It's not the other. It's noise, which is why I want to talk to you about a couple of engineering principles that I spent the last two weeks working on in the back of a helicopter. So, um, literally, last couple of weeks, I've been in the back of a helicopter working with something called the signal-to-noise ratio. Do you guys know what the signal-to-noise ratio is? Yeah. It's fascinating. So SNR, if you've ever done signal processing. The signal-to-noise ratio is the, the idea that you can look at something like this, and you can see all this noise in here. But somewhere in there, if you were to develop a trend line across this data, you would be able to see an actual signal in there. That's kind of how your FM radio works. If you're changing the stations, you're like a Mexican trumpet or something like that, right? And so what's happening is once it meets a certain signal to noise threshold, you're able to get beyond the noise and you're actually able to get a good signal. So what I would encourage people to do when they're interacting with other humans on the internet, specifically ones that share your ideas and ones that don't share your ideas, is think about the signal to noise ratio, okay? Is this person angry and upset? Is this just noise? Or is this an actual valuable data set that I could use. Now, it works everywhere. Like, I read all different kinds of stuff, you know. We, we read Dawkins, Hitchens, all this kind of stuff. And even within those different groups, even within a subset, you have different signal-to-noise ratios. I would submit that Hitchens had a much higher signal-to-noise ratio than Dawkins. And it's, it's important to me to, to be able to read those different things. I, I still remember, as a matter of fact, where I was when Hitchens died. It affected me. It affected me a lot, actually. So Christopher Hitchens, if anybody doesn't know, he's a great author. And uh, what I liked about him is that, what? Why is everybody laughing? We all know him. Yeah, I know you know him. So there's a Christian talking about Hitchens. That's why it's funny. I get it. Okay, I get it now. So, but, you know, he, he was kind of like elevated as like this dude that was like, he is the trump card. I would just throw Hitchens at anybody. But don't think that you're the only person that's looking at Hitchens because... Seriously, the guy was awesome. I was on Hobbs Island Road in Huntsville, Alabama the day he died. I remember it because it affected me, because I feel like I had lost a friend. Okay? So I just want to say that, that, you know, it's important to see both sides of an argument. And here, this is why. So this is a, uh, a basic control loop. Okay? This is an engineering thing. I'll try to make it quick. So a control loop, the idea of what you do, kind of like the chicken, right? The chicken, he, he knew where his head was. Actually, it's kind of interesting. The chicken, what he'll do is, the reason they do that is they put their head in a position and then they'll walk under it. And they'll put their head in a position and they'll walk under it again because they can't hold their eyes stable on an object like you can and I can. It has some, you have something called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. They don't. Anyway, so the idea behind a control loop is you have an input to the system. It's processed. And then you have an output. And if you're able to tap off of that output, and figure out what's happening and then put it back into the input, then you can get to truth a lot faster. I'll give you an example. Um, There's this one time we were shooting a rocket. This happened. We were shooting a rocket. And the rocket was zooming across the range. And we were trying to track it with a camera. So we put a camera on that rocket. And it starts moving. And it jumps out ahead of our camera. So we go and we try to pick up that rocket and we overshoot it and it's still moving. And then it outruns us, and we do this, right? We can't get a good track on the rocket. We have ground truth because we have a radar looking at the position of the rocket. We know exactly where the rocket is. But all we're trying to do is align our camera with the ground truth. We're trying to align our vision, or the way we see the event, with truth. That's what we're trying to do. And we can't do it. We tried a lot to try to do that, and we couldn't do it. And the reason we couldn't do it 
is because we didn't have the right kind of feedback into the system. Is this making sense? All right. This is how I approach things in my life, not just engineering things, but everything, really, everything I can. So what I would like to say about the rocket is it's important in a feedback loop to have both positive and negative inputs back into the system, okay? Because what happens if you only have positive feedback? You say something, your idea, and you go talk to the people that share that idea with you, and you say it to them. What happens? What kind of feedback do you get? Positive feedback, right? Right? So what happens to the signal? The next time you say the thing, are you more confident or less confident in it? More confident. You say the thing. You have that positive feedback. You keep going, and eventually what happens to that argument or your viewpoint on that particular subject? It goes unstable. What would happen if I were to take this microphone off and go find the speaker and set it next to the speaker? What would happen? You get feedback. Why would you get feedback? You only have positive feedback in the system. So negative feedback is really, really important. It works like this. If you're trying to get to some level and you're trying to, to shoot to it, it'll look like this. And it'll do this. It'll dampen out, right? Have you guys ever seen that? A guitar string or anything like that? You get a signal and then it dampens back down because you get negative feedback and then you go back to truth. That's the goal. The goal is to get to truth as quickly as possible. And to do that, often you have to have negative feedback. That's why it's important to surround yourself, not necessarily surround yourself and like get beat up or anything like that, but surround yourself with people who don't necessarily share the viewpoints that you do or I do. I try to do that all the time. I've got a large YouTube channel in the science realm, right? How many other Christians do you think have channels like that on YouTube? Zero, yep, it's just me. I've got a huge negative feedback loop, right? <laughs> it's important. It's really a good thing. Um, we have those conversations. The guys that are around me, they think, I'm, you know, some of them think I'm absolutely crazy. They think I've done the little compartmental, you know, you're doing your Alabama Jesus thing and you're doing your smart rocket thing and you got a line in between your brain somewhere, you know. That's what they think. Some people, other people take the time to invest in my life and learn what kind of human I am and have conversations with me and they eat at the table at my house and, and we become friends, and they love me, and I love them, and I would die for them. And we have very, very strong relationships. I'm not embellishing here. We really have strong relationships. So what kind of system do you think is the best? So just think about that. Okay, so uh, this is a fun experiment. I'm just going to explain it to you. Do this. Next time you're in the car, if you have glasses that have, like, a strap on the back or something like that, hang it on the rearview mirror. And when you're driving down the road, um, do this safely, all right? Kind of start bumping the wheel a little bit while you're driving. Not like this. Make sure this is, this is, I need to get people to sign a waiver before I tell you this. Just bump the wheel a little bit and watch what your sunglasses do on the, on the rearview mirror. They'll swing. And then as it's going oscillatory, try to get it back to stasis. Try to get it back to zero. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to play with it. When it's here and it's about to swim back that way, you're going to pull the wheel say, go back. And what's going to happen? It's going to overshoot because that's positive feedback. But when you're on the other side and you kind of swerve to it, it'll kind of catch it and get back down. Play with that next time you're in the, in the car. And maybe don't, whatever. <laughs> I think you know what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is I want you to not hate me because of positive and negative feedback loops and control system theory. That didn't work at all. I'm going to move to the next slide now. <laughs> so, Let's talk a little bit about why skepticism is good. I'm going to drink a little bit of water here. You guys think skepticism is good? You do? Why? Do you think I think skepticism is good? I think skepticism is good, namely because it keeps me alive. I'll explain more about that in a minute. I want to show you kind of how I view the world. I literally caught something on camera. I didn't realize I was doing this at the time, but I caught a moment of like pure lizard brain reaction to an event, and I got to see kind of like down into the depths of me as a person, okay? So um, skepticism means you can't cut corners. You have, to, you have to be proven, right? It has to be proven to you before you accept it. Check this out. We're in the Amazon rainforest, right? The guy that makes sound or the music for Smarter Every Day, his name is Gordon. Awesome dude, real good friend. We don't share the same beliefs, but we love each other. 
So Gordon and I are in the Amazon rainforest with another guy named Phil Torres, and we stumble upon something that's stinking weird. I mean, like, out there, weird. It's a spider, and it's a spider on the left, okay? How many legs does that spider on the left have? Eight, maybe. But here's the thing, that little thing right here, the cloudy thing, that's not a spider. The thing is right on top, that little thing on the top, that's the spider. It's a little spider that went and got a bunch of junk and put it in his web and made a bigger spider. And he shakes it to make it look like he's bigger than he really is. Why? No stinking clue. No idea. You've got a mechanical engineer from Alabama in the Peruvian rainforest. You got two other guys there. We stumble on this spider. What you're gonna hear is pure Alabama reaction to something that I have no idea what's going on. The first person you're gonna hear, what's interesting about this thing is like it appears to be able to count. It's got eight legs on this thing. All right? It's got an abdomen and it's got a cephalothorax. Is this true? So anyway, this is us walking up on it. The first person you're going to hear is Gordon talking. He's the one that discovered it. Uh, Phil and I are sitting there. You'll see Phil's face first. And then you're going to hear me narrating in the background. I think you'll be able to tell which one is mine because of the redneck. <laughs> so here we go. There's a tiny, it's a tiny spider disguised as a big spider. Shut up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Correct number of legs no. on, the, on the fake. Yeah. Okay, so we are in the jungle, and our current theory is that this tiny, tiny, tiny spider at the top of this, keep me back with it there, Gordon, it's working good. This tiny spider has created, is that dust, what are we thinking? Debris that looks like a big spider, and he's vibrating the whole web to make it look like he is a big spider. This doesn't seem like it could be a tree. We have to research that. I'm sticking in the middle of the rainforest and I'm seeing it with my eyes. And what do I say? This can't be true. Right? What is that happening in my lizard brain there? What is that? Skepticism, right? Why? Why am I doing that? Aren't I never seen it before? It's different to me. I don't understand. Something to think about. That's kind of how my brain works. I, I was fortunate enough to be able to have an event that I accidentally recorded on camera that I get to understand how my brain worked fundamentally. It's kind of neat. So skepticism, let's talk about it. Is skepticism a tool that you can use to arrive at a more perfect truth about the world? Or is it a philosophy? Like nothing's true until it's proven 100%. Or is it a tool that you can use to arrive at the truth easier? What is it? Yes. I don't know. This is for you. You know, this is, this is for your brain, for you to have a discussion in your brain. Is the point to get to the truth, or is the point the skepticism itself? What is the point? I don't know, there's something to think about. What is the point? We're at Skepticon. Why, why are we at Skepticon? Is the point skepticism, or is the point truth? Something to think about. So, I want to talk about something that I call my threshold of belief. We're getting into the weird part now where I'm, I'm weird and, you know, you and I are so stinking similar. We are like rock solid, boom, I've been promised a mountain of high fives, I'm going to deliver my half of the mountain of high fives. I mean, we are like right there together. And then we're looking at the data of this world just a little bit differently. So this is what I call the threshold of belief. I can't tell you what I'm doing in this picture. But what I can tell you is the thing I'm messing with with a wrench has the ability to kill me instantly. There's no, there's no, like, no jokes or anything like that. Thing can kill me. What I do is dangerous work, okay? And at some point, if I'm ever going to move off of top dead center and make a decision and do anything other than talk about these interesting things, if I'm ever going to make a decision and do something, I have to get to a point where I can say, okay, I think I know enough information about this system to make a decision to do something like this. And I don't think it's going to kill me. That's heavy. That's heavy stuff, especially when you got kids at home, right? These are the sorts of things I do every day. So what is your personal threshold of belief? What has to happen in order for you to move from, okay, probably, to let's do it. It's not going to kill me. What, what does it take for you to get there? It's something to think about. It really is. It's something I've thought about 
every single week of my professional career because it's something I have to deal with, and it's not a joke. It's, it's real, real big boy stuff. Um, so think about it in your brain. What is the threshold belief? Do you have to see it with your eyes? Do you have to, I don't know. Everybody has something, and this is probably what the number line looks like. So you've got 100% right here. You have to 100% be proven that whatever it is that the person's trying to sell you or prove to you or whatever, you're either there or maybe you're down here, more likely than not, eh, probably won't kill me, <laughs> you know? I've met people like that, crazy. Anyway, so most people are somewhere in here. People are complicated, right? People are complicated. And the cool thing about having a brain yourself and the cool thing about me having a brain myself is I get to pick out which dot I'm going to be on, okay? It's pretty cool. It's interesting to think about. I call this the threshold of belief. And it's not fancy. This is Alabama simple words. This is, this is kind of how I can process this stuff. The reason the threshold belief is so important to me is I got some kids at home, and I know that, I know that they depend on their daddy. And they depend on their daddy to come home and feed them at night, and they depend on their daddy for hugs, and they depend on all this sort of stuff. So my threshold of belief, I kid you not, I've quantified it. I've, I've said this in super important meetings. My threshold of belief is what I call the Sadie test. I have a beautiful little girl, her name is Sadie, and I say, you know what, I have to get enough understanding on this system to know that it's safe to the point that I would do this with Sadie standing right beside me. Because I love her. Man, I love that girl. I love all my kids, but I call it the Sadie test because I had her first and I started doing this stuff back when she was young. That's my threshold of belief. I've quantified it. Um, so what is your threshold of belief? What's interesting is, uh, is that the thing that people don't like about me, I, I am a Christian, and I know, I know that weirds people out. You know, it really does. My threshold of belief for this God thing, to me, it was an easy jump for me to, to see that God existed in, in my mind. I'm, I'm not projecting my beliefs on anybody, and I don't want you to get upset or anything like that. This is just where I'm at and talking from the heart here. So I believe God exists, and it was self-evident for me. It was, it was kind of easy for me to make that jump, and I don't think it was childhood stories or anything like that. It was, had a lot to do with a flower in the middle of a grassy field one day. But, but think about it. To say that God exists and then to make the next jump and go to, okay, well, you got the God thing and then you got the Jesus thing. That's a totally different step, right? So how can Destin, this guy that seems like he's pretty honest with himself, yeah, he sounds like a redneck engineer, but how can he go from from God to Jesus. Jesus, who did some kind of interesting things. Jesus said that he was God, okay? Probably the single most egotistical thing that's ever been uttered from human lips. Can we agree on that? <laughs> Pretty stinking egotistical. But people heard him say it and they believed it. I don't know, you might not believe that even, but that's okay. So that's a pretty egotistical thing to, to say. So you got God, grave, and grace. Jesus supposedly, Zombie Jesus happened, right? Supposedly, these weirdo Christians believe that this Jesus guy rose from the dead. That's crazy, bizarre stuff. And then the weirdest thing of all, which had a lot to do with where I found my belief, and I met my threshold of belief, is this weird thing called grace. I believe that I'm a, I'm a screw-up, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to push my beliefs on you, and I, I won't go any further, but if you'd like to know more, you, you're smart people, you know how to filter through the signal-to-noise ratio yourself. But anyway... I got to a point, and all I'm saying is my threshold of belief was met on all that stuff, which sounds crazy to you, and it sounds stupid, and I know it sounds stupid, and I'm okay with that, and I'm not threatened by that. I know you're not threatened by me because I'm the redneck guy from Alabama that doesn't know what I'm doing, right? I'm okay with that. But what I want to get people to recognize is there are people that aren't really 100% crazy that believe this stuff. Because what we're doing is we're all filtering through the same data. You all got certain holes on your body, right? You got eyes. You got, what are you thinking about? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about instrumentation ports like eyes, ears, and nose. I, I don't know about you. So think about it. We all look at this world, and we have all this data in front of us. The data is the world itself. And we're collecting this, and we're filtering it. We're running it through our signal processors. Yours is different than mine. You're on a different dot than I am. And I hit a point where my threshold of belief was met. So 
What I want to do now is I want to do a demonstration, something that kind of blew my mind a little bit. There was a guy that was a welder. Um, he is a welder. Working with him. His name's Barney. Barney called me one day and he said, hey man, I got a weird bicycle. I need you to come down here and ride my bicycle in the weld shop. And I was like, what the heck are you talking about? Barney wants me to ride his bicycle? That makes no sense. And so Barney called me down to the shop and uh, he showed me this bicycle and it flipped my world upside down. It really did. So let me, let me get the bicycle. Is there anybody that knows how to ride a bike in here? Do you know how to ride a bike? Let's see, in the, in the black shirt back here. Well, yeah. What's your shirt say? Science something? Ruining everything since 1543. Ruining everything since... No, I don't believe that. Come on, come up here. So, what was your name, sir? Max. Max? Max. Matt. Matt, can you ride a bicycle? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so, this is something that happened to me a long time ago. Oh, by the way, there's kind of a formality we have to go through. So, the, uh, the Ramada Inn Convention Center... They said that their threshold of belief was not met, that we wouldn't kill ourselves on this bicycle. So we have to sign this piece of paper. Feel free to read the whole thing, because I never sign anything that I don't read. Feel free to, sign, to read that thing. And if you choose to uh, get on this really weird contraption, is that not the ugliest bicycle you've ever seen in your life? This is what I want to do. I want to show you what Barney did to me and how it messed with my brain. Check this out. I, this is the fun part for me, because I'm an engineer. I really like this. You ever seen a bicycle like this? You have? Dayhan, yeah. Isn't that cool? All right, so this is a normal bike, right? Some of you have seen the video. But we've done one thing different. What is the one thing we've done different? The controls are reversed. The controls are reversed. So here's what I want to explain. So this bicycle, does everybody in the room understand how this bicycle works? Look at it real good. Do you understand how it works? What happens? Somebody explain it. When you turn right, the wheel goes to the left. Let's go ahead and throw a helmet on. And when you turn left, the wheel goes to the right. Okay. So can we all agree that everybody understands how this bicycle works? Everybody raise your hand. We're smart people. Pretty much everybody's raising your hand. Okay. So here we go. Did you sign to meet the threshold of belief, the Ramada in that we're not going to hurt ourselves? Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. So Matt, what we're going to do is something that Barney did to me. He asked me to ride this bicycle. All we've done is we've changed one variable, and we all understand how this bike works. And so what we're going to do, let's just make this interesting. Um, let's do this. Let's go one, two, three, four steps. What I want you to do is use all of the understanding, all of the sensory inputs, all the data that you have at your disposal, and just use that understanding to operate the bike. Go for it. Get, get to me. Oh, come on, man. Give it a shot. <laughs> All right. Now, hold on, man. Hold on. Wait. Oh, we, let's, talk, let's talk this through. Let's, let's have a little meeting over here. Let's have a meeting. All right. So if we want to go to the right, which way are we going to turn the pedal? And if we want to go to the left, which way are we going to turn the pedal? Right. Okay. So let's try it again. Hold on. One, two, three, four. Okay. Go for it. Oh, man. What's going on, Matt? Can you explain what's going on in your head right now? 40 years of muscle memory. What's that? 40 years of muscle memory. But we're smart. We're smart people, Matt. We are smart people. We can figure this out. Give it a shot. Maybe I'll just go straight. Straight. No pedaling, maybe. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? It's so weird. I can't stop myself. I can't stop myself from turning the wrong way. Isn't that strange? It's really, really, really frustrating, okay? It's funny, it's funny to everybody except for Matt. I promise, this is crazy. What's happening right now is every internet argument you've ever participated in. Is it not? It's really weird, and are you not more frustrated right now than you've been in a really long time? I knew this was gonna happen, it's still frustrating. Yeah, so what's going on right now is Matt's brain is getting in the way of Matt's brain. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what's happening. It's Can I get a shot, Matt? So everybody say thank you to Matt. I really appreciate it. So, so Matt, I have, a, uh, I have a shirt. Actually, let me show you. I had, my wife had these shirts made. I have a shirt with a backwards bicycle on it, and uh, I've got one in the room for you. I get it. I'm a bad person. I forgot to bring it. So everybody say thank you to Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. So 
Is there anybody that just watched that and like, well, Matt's just got 40 years of muscle memory and Matt thinks that uh, something's, I can, I can ride the bike. Is there anybody that thinks that? So when I first got on this bike, I had a moment that I can't really explain. Everything came to my mind all at once. I realized that I had been trained to think a certain way, and the person that trained me to think this way was me, right? All right, so here's the deal. You cannot begin to understand how frustrating this is. You really can't. This is the most frustrating thing I've ever done in my life. And when I did this, Cody, I mean, it's not, excuse me, not Cody, I'm bad with name today. Barney, the welder, was laughing his head off. The whole time. He made this because he's a sadistic little redneck welder in Alabama, and he wanted to just mess with me and see what he could do. So what I did is I went and got a bike, and I practiced, and I practiced, and I practiced. How long do you think it took me to ride this bike, just like I'm doing on stage right now? What's that? A month? 30 minutes? Two days. Took me eight months. Took me eight months to do that. You know why? Because my brain was getting in the way of my brain. Okay? So I decided, you know, I got all these people that, that think a certain way in my life, and I think just like them. I'm going to try to do something different, and it's going to be weird, but it's going to involve sticking a bicycle at the top of my driveway, and I'm going to ride a different kind of bicycle every stinking day for five minutes, and I'm going to reprogram my brain and figure out a different way to think. But you know what happened? What's that? Because I've got a problem. I can't ride a normal bike. So here's what's been happening to me. Every day for a year, I've looked at this bike and been very satisfied that I had dominated this thing. Feel really good about myself. But one day in Amsterdam, a really long time ago, I got back on a normal bike. This was a year ago, in fact. And when I got on this bike, I decided to impress the people of Amsterdam with my ability to ride this thing because um, they would be super impressed, right? Let me pull this up here. So I got on a bike in Amsterdam and I started just trying to ride it. These are people that came to see me um, at a Smarter Everyday meetup. I have a Twitter account, Smarter Everyday, and I tweeted these people, and they came to meet me because they thought I was smart or something weird like that. It turns out, I got their bike out, and they instantly started making fun of me. <laughs> because after all, nobody can forget how to ride a bike, right? <laughs> Except idiots from Alabama. But I was trying to explain to them, I was like, no, it's not, it's not that simple. I'm not just an idiot from Alabama. I have gone out of my way to try to learn a different way of thinking. And so people started lining up and looking at the dumb American. And like, they, they literally started gathering up, and they're like, what's wrong with this guy? And then something, uh, something interesting happened. Let me see where my mouse is here. Um, I got frustrated, obviously, as you do, and I started trying to explain to them why I couldn't ride the bike. I went and got references, and I was like, look, look, this is why I can't ride the bike. Look at how I ride my fancy bike at the house. And I just got really, really frustrated. Does that not sound like every internet argument you've ever had? <laughs> but go look at these references. They back up my point. So here's what I've been doing. I haven't ridden a normal bike since the Amsterdam incident. And I want to make this really depressing and sad. And, and this might not work. I really have no idea. I haven't ridden in 12 months because I wanted to go to Skepticon. And I wanted to do this in front of you guys. And I wanted to see how long it would take me to snap back, and this might not happen. So is it okay if I try to ride a bike in front of you guys? All right, so I can ride it the other way. I'm just gonna try to ride that 10 feet. So here we go. <laughs> Starts out funny, it really does. All right, so. Uh... All right, so this is every internet argument we've ever had because what's happening right now is I can't see things the way you guys see it. Seriously, this is not funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. 
Let me try again. I'm going to, I'm not getting very far, so I'm just going to see if you can see what I'm doing wrong. I'm turning it the wrong way. This might not happen, guys. So, so this is where I'm at in my life. I have a master's degree in rocket propulsion. I can't ride a bicycle. So, so, so here's the deal. This is what I want you to think about with your life. Seriously, the first degree I got was a mechanical engineering degree. And I'm looking at these, these gears right here. And I can tell you the contact stress angle on these gears. I can tell you the name of the curve. It's called an involute curve. I can tell you the pitch diameter. I can tell you everything about those gears. I can't stink and ride a bike. So what does that mean, guys? What is the application to our own lives here? I'm angry if you can't tell. <laughs> what is the application in this? You can brainwash yourself. You can change the way you think. We all have cognitive biases. And you can do whatever you want to try to change that cognitive bias. And you might succeed. And if you succeed in changing that cognitive bias, you're not going to be more of a free thinker. At least in my case, this is me. I'm talking about me. I have no idea what you're doing with your life. <laughs> what I discovered about my brain is that I can make an effort to think differently, unlike anybody else in this world, and stink and unlearn how to ride a bicycle. But all I've done is just change my cognitive bias. So how do I know what truth is? I give up. So, I really wanted that to work. So, this is what I want to, I'm really mad. This is, this is what I want to, to hit home here. Just because you meet somebody that doesn't see things the way you do. There's one guy in this room that can ride this bike, this backwards bicycle in, in the backwards mode, right? And there's one guy in this room that can't ride it the normal way. And it's really, really, really frustrating that I can't see your point of view right now. And I can't ride a bicycle like you can. How does that translate to rational thought? How does that translate to religion, faith? All these things, the important questions. We're just talking about a bicycle. But what about the questions that matter? I'm sorry, I have to do this again. <laughs> How does this translate? I, I just assume right now you have pity on me because you seem like nice people and you promised me high fives. How are, how are you feeling about me right now? Do I look like an idiot? Are you mad at me? It, you're scared for me. Is anybody mad at me right now? Because when we disagree with people on the internet who simply can't see things the way we do, we tend to get mad and we tend to call them names. Anyway, that's what I want you to think about. It's not that I don't want to see things your way, because I want that more than anything in the world right now, I promise. <laughs> took me 12 months. I'm going to go home and try to learn to ride that bike both ways, because the next time I do a talk, I want to be able to do it both ways. But my point is, when you see somebody that doesn't look at the world just like you do, don't get mad at them. Love them, right? Just like you had pity on me up here because I'm an idiot from Alabama that can't ride a bicycle even though I got a piece of paper saying I'm really smart, but apparently I'm not because I can't ride a bicycle. <laughs> Think about me. Think about the idiot from Alabama. The next time you get ready to go into an internet debate, you're like, man, maybe this guy that I'm arguing with has some kind of threshold of belief that has been met that I don't see. And it doesn't make him bad because we have the same things in, in mind. We want the same goals. We want to do, we want to see the world in a good way. We want the scientific method to be applied so that we have peace in our lives, right? So anyway, that's the closing thought. Unity. Even though I'm a Christian, even though there are Muslims, even though there are Jewish people, even though there are atheists, even though there are whatever fill in the blank here is that you want to think about, we all need to look at each other respectfully and peacefully, and we need to rationally talk with each other not to change people's minds, 
but to help us in the attempt to see through the noise, to see the signal so that we can get closer to truth together. Peace, that's what it's about. Let's work together in peace. There you go. I'm Destin. That's it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I will now begin collecting the mountain of high fives. And uh, that's it. I hope to see you maybe outside in the parking lot. We'll let you guys try the backwards bicycle. But thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, everybody. It is prom time.